While the Prime Minister's uh, state visit to the United States uh, is a huge statement when it comes uh, to India's cultural might, but it's not just that. There is meetings with business leaders, there are very significant deals that are being signed, especially when it comes to India's defense capabilities. U.S.-India deals will give it another push in enhancing our force capability. India's eyeing deals that enable it to jointly manufacture the GE F-414 fighter jet engines and the sale of armed Predator drones. Apart from these key deals, uh, there is also the Striker F-18 deals which are on the cards. These key deals between the two superpowers are aimed at a close defense cooperation, greater integration and sharing of technology and information, key strategic interests. India and America are looking at cooperating more on the issue of hypersonic technology, advanced materials to help India build on cutting edge technology besides collaborating in autonomous underwater capabilities. India's resolve of Atmanirbhar defense has also seen a decline in imports of defense products from Russia. But if we were to just simplify it, if it comes to try and parse through all of this verbiage, what do these deals mean to us? We are joined by Cleo Pascal, Senior Fellow at the Foundation for Defense of Democracy, and Dr. John Harrison, who is from the Rabdan Academy. Cleo Pascal, I want to start with you, because way back in 2014 or 2015, immediately after the inauguration of Prime Minister Modi, you had said that there's going to be a complete redesign of India's foreign policy. Do you think that that is almost close to completion? What you had foreseen, it's been done almost 90, 99%. <laughs> Thank you for remembering. Uh, I think it was it was basically uh, reflecting what has what was being said within the Indian strategic community, which was there was definitely a desire to do it. Uh, it. It took a while because the cobwebs from some of the old systems were very deeply entrenched. But uh, I think we're really seeing it now, uh, and it's a top to bottom rethink and redirection and reinvigoration of what India can be and will be, I think, uh, to, to many other countries in the world. The, the, what we're seeing now, the India we're seeing now, uh, is not only uh, giving hope, I think, to a lot of Indians that their future is going to be more in their hands, but giving hope to a lot of other countries that uh, they have a third option, another way to go. Tell me this, if you compare the foreign policy of 2013 and 2023, can you name two major departures? Uh, I think that the way that India has taken control on the political warfare battlefield is one. Uh, that's where the, the main contention is now. It's not so much kinetic. It's this. It's the battle for the mind. And China has really been uh, dominating. And you can see it just in, in one simple case, TikTok. Mm -hmm. The way that they use TikTok to get into the brains of uh, children, teenagers all around the world, India saw that, and two weeks after Galwan, it was one of the 59 apps that was banned. Mm. That is something nobody else has managed. The U.S. still hasn't managed that. That's completely new. And also the way that India is managing its economic development. I mean, it really is serious about uh, creating a... Uh, an economy that that is built from the ground up and can sustain it uh, through rough times, through times of sanctions, through times of uh, in, in global inflation. Those two things alone um, put India in a much stronger position than it was 10 years ago. Please stay with me, Ambassador John Bolton, former uh, NSA, is also joining us live. I'll ask you very bluntly, sir. Many in India are saying that for the state visit to be accorded, to Mr. Modi should be seen not so much as a statement of India's importance, but as India being a counterweight to China. How would you respond? Well, I think it's inevitably a combination. Uh, India, uh, now the world's most populous country, is going to be a significant factor in the 21st century no matter what. But it would be blind to everybody concerned, not, India being not least of all, that uh, we are collectively threatened by uh, Chinese desires for hegemony along its uh, Indo-Pacific periphery and, and ultimately globally. So uh, it's, a, it's a complex relationship between the U.S. and India. There's still a lot of issues to be worked out. But, you know, we have a saying in the United States that I think confronts India today, and it is when you come to a fork in the road, take it. 
I think India is going to have to make a choice. I don't think it can continue over a sustained period. Uh, patterns of cooperation with Russia, particularly in the present circumstances, and particularly as Russia grows ever closer to China. China is the dominant partner in a new axis between Beijing and Moscow. I think that leaves, uh, based on India's history, leaves it in ultimately an unsustainable position. I hope that we can get closer to India. I hope India can get closer to countries in the region like Japan and Australia. Uh, and I understand how complicated it is, but I think that's the direction that would be in India's best interest to take, and it would be in the U.S.'s best interest as well. Prime Minister Modi has said that India is the natural leader of the global south. Does America see it that way? Well, I think uh, at some point here in the not too distant future, the north-south distinction is is uh, due to disappear effectively as the east-west distinction disappeared. Uh, and uh, it's it's a question really of attitude and, and views looking forward, uh, but I don't expect it to happen overnight. And uh, I think, again, given the history, I understand what uh, Mr. Modi is saying, but I think ultimately these distinctions are they're in the process of disappearing right now. The deals that India has signed, uh, whether it be, uh, you know, the armed drone, whether it be the predator, is it about just money, America's interest in India? Is it just about taking India's money? Or do you think that the cooperation, especially the defense cooperation between the two, the understanding between the two has genuinely become deeper? Well, I think it has genuinely become deeper. I hope it becomes deeper still. This question of uh, purchasing uh, weapon systems is is one of the hardest problems I think India still has to work its way through because of decades of uh, dependence on sophisticated Soviet and then Russian uh, weapon systems. I'm sure India should be looking at its building up its own capability. I think that's what Mr. Modi is very much interested in. But but moving away from Russia uh, is not something you can do overnight. Part of the problem is that uh, what the military likes to call interoperability uh, for nations to cooperate effectively with sophisticated weapon systems uh, they have to be able to work together the systems have to talk together and function together obviously if you're using precisely the same system that's no problem but when india buys for example the s-400 air defense system very sophisticated a piece of equipment from Russia, uh, it's simply not possible for the United States and our other allies to put our F-35, our most sophisticated fighter plane, uh, anywhere near the S-400 system. So uh, there's, uh, I think part of the discussion, certainly at the defense minister level, uh, will be how to work out these these problems. And uh, I don't I don't think anybody's expecting them to be solved tomorrow. I just hope we can continue to make visible progress. And yet India has managed to maintain very cordial relations with both countries at the same time. Do you think that is because a critical barrier of political trust has been crossed or other political mistrust over the years has been crossed? Well, I think I think uh, India and the United States have certainly had a lot of disagreements over the years. I think I think uh, we're making progress toward increasing trust. Uh, I would just suggest uh, uh, to India that continued trust with Russia is going to be harder and harder as China increasingly comes to dominate the bilateral Moscow-Beijing relationship. In effect now, uh, I, I don't want to overstate this, but uh, Russia is becoming so much a secondary partner in that relationship that it, it's acting in some respects as a surrogate for China. And if you look at the three-way relationship between India, China, and Russia, I think, uh, I think that's very hard for India to sustain. What would the options in front of India? Well, I think breaking from Russia is the critical point. I think recognizing is uh, certainly some plans written in India do that China is the principal adversary, the principal threat to India. Then India can make decisions about how to deal with that. I think the A Asian security quad, uh, Japan, uh, India, Australia, and the US is a step forward. Uh, I don't think India has to buy weapon systems only from the United States. There are actually some European systems that aren't bad. And I think India will develop its own weapon systems. And I think that's fine. But you can't be dependent, particularly at the high end, the high tech end of weapon systems on a supplier who's subordinate to your principal adversary. Let me ask you finally, uh, Mr. Bolton, 
What does America want from India? And I'm sorry I'm being blunt, but you know, to have a state visit, to have for the second time Mr. Modi addressing a joint sitting of the U.S. Congress, what does America really want? Well, I think they'd like a closer relationship across the board. We, we haven't talked about economics, uh, uh, but I think uh, the the fact that uh, uh, that India uh, has uh, English as a as a, a second official language, in effect, and that millions and millions of people in India speak English, uh, gives the possibility for economic cooperation that simply doesn't exist between two countries of comparable size and and economy. Uh, so uh, we've talked about the security side of things, which which I deal with, which I think is very important. Mm. But I think these deals are uh, not just security oriented. This is real economic uh, integration. And I think uh, both countries should welcome that. And finally, let me ask you, the, the longest time, the one uh, grudge that India had was the constant hyphenation with Pakistan. Has that successfully ended. Nobody's talking about the two in the same breath. Right. Well, I, I, I think this goes back really to the George W. Bush administration. I think uh, I think he and uh, Secretary of State uh, Colin Powell worked very hard to break that linkage that had persisted for so many decades. And uh, I think it has been broken, which is not to say the United States doesn't have very significant interest in dealing with Pakistan. Mm -hmm. But in, in the big picture on the global issues, uh, in India is I hope, going to be a much more significant partner going forward. Mr. Bolton, thank you very much. Ambassador John Bolton, former National Security Advisor, joining us live and exclusive on Times Now. Like we said, the most informed, the most critical, and the best perspectives right here on Times Now. Let's cut across also live to the White House now, where you have the performances starting. Malvika, tell us what's happening. <laughs> All right, as you can imagine, like we've been saying, ever since people started gathering there on the lawns of the White House, there has been quite a din, people singing, dancing, celebrating the performances that have started there. It's quite difficult to be able to get through there. Malvika Jain is there on the lawns of the White House. If you can hear me now, Malvika, what's on the cards, what's happening right now, and how long before Mr. Modi arrives? for the Prime Minister's arrival, who is expected in, in the next 45 minutes here at the South Lawn in uh, Washington, D.C. This is a significant meeting as we have been reporting because after the ceremonial reception, there are going to be bilateral meetings between the two leaders which are going to go on for about two hours. Issues of defense cooperation, if it, issues uh, surrounding uh, cooperation in the area of uh, uh, technology and also the growing importance of India geopolitical is something that is going to be discussed because remember that India right now is it's not a choice in the United States whether wants to talk with India or not, but India is a crucial partner uh, that the U.S. needs. India is going to continue to retain its independence as it has been preserved from time to time. So it is going to be a day of significant developments later in the day. The Prime Minister is also going to be addressing it in the beginning of the U.S. Congress. So a lot of action and anticipation uh, from this joint uh, bilateral meeting between the President of the United States and Prime Minister. All right, still quite difficult to be able to understand Malka, but that's only to be expected. Imagine the sheer number of people who are present there and the crowd is only swelling as we are counting down to the arrival of the Prime Minister. We will have, of course, the White House arrival ceremony. It will include a military review, a performance of both the country's national anthems and then remarks by both heads of state. You don't want to miss it, so don't touch that remote. Don't go anywhere. We're back in a minute.